Animals, whether it is male or female or both, the purpose of every flower is to do its part in making seeds so that the plant can reproduce itself and the species will not die out. How flowers go about doing this can be very simple or extremely complicated and even ingenious. And in order to understand the process, we must be familiar with the parts involved. Let's take a look at a fairly typical flower, like this lily. The showy part of the flower, the part that makes it so attractive, is the corolla. And this corolla is often divided up into petals. Within the corolla of this lily, we can find six stamens and a pistil. And these parts are essential to seed production. The stamens, or the male parts of the flower, produce pollen. And the pistil, or female part of the flower, produces seeds. In order for fertile seeds to be formed by the pistil, pollen must come in contact with the sensitive tip of the pistil called the stigma. But here is the most important clue to understanding flowers. The most hardy and healthy seeds are formed if the pollen that touches a flower's stigma comes from the stamens of a separate flower, not from its own. In other words, to grow the most hardy seeds, our lily must receive on its stigma the pollen from another lily. Cross-pollination is preferable to self-pollination. Pollen must get from one flower to another. And this preference for cross-pollination is so strong among flowers that a great number of our common flowers have evolved ways of ensuring that they will increase their chances of being cross-pollinated while reducing the possibility of self-pollinating. Many of our trees have solved the problem by keeping the male parts and the female parts separated in separate flowers. Flowers with only stamens are called staminate flowers, while flowers with only pistils are called pistillate flowers. Obviously, flowers with this arrangement can't possibly self-pollinate because they have only half the required parts. Sometimes the staminate and pistillate flowers are on the same tree, and sometimes they are on separate trees. But how does the pollen from the male flowers get to the pistils of the female flowers? Trees like the pines and cedars use the wind to get their pollen to the proper places. These trees produce such an enormous amount of pollen that for a few days each spring, the air is literally filled with clouds of their yellow dust. And we can often see where some of it has settled on the surface of a quiet pond. This system may seem a bit haphazard and wasteful, but it works, and most of the pistillate flowers of these trees receive their share of pollen. There is, however, one problem with this system. Only the female flowers will produce seed, and this is only half of the plant's efforts. These male pine flowers will not produce their own seeds. Neither will these beautiful male willow catkins nor these red maple flowers. If the purpose of a flower is to make seeds, then these plants waste a lot of energy growing flowers that cannot do this. It would be more efficient for a plant to grow flowers with both male and female parts. And in this way, every flower would have the potential to make seeds. This is what most plants do. Most pistils in the same blossom but this presents another problem. How to ensure cross-pollination while preventing the flower from pollinating itself? That is, how to get the pollen from one flower to another. It just so happens that certain insects like bees and butterflies and moths are extremely fond of sweet nectar. The flowers take full advantage of this happy coincidence and with luscious perfumes and bright colored showy corollas advertise to the bees, moths and butterflies that they have a generous supply of nectar and pollen for them if they will only help with the work of cross-pollination. And that is what, not for us, but for the insects. 
Flowers are designed in such a way that when a bee or butterfly comes to sip nectar, it must deliver to the stigma any pollen it has on its body when it arrives. And when it leaves, it must take with it still more pollen. In this way, cross-pollination is accomplished. But while the bee is fumbling around looking for nectar, how does the flower keep its own pollen from getting on its own stigma? Different types of flowers have different mechanisms for preventing this, but there is one system that is most widely used. The stamens and, usually, the stamens mature first, shedding their pollen before the stigma is receptive. By the time the stigma is ready to receive pollen, all the pollen from that flower has been taken away by the bee. The system is particularly well demonstrated by the creeping bellflower. The creeping bellflower grows in spikes which mature from the bottom up. When a bellflower first opens, we can see that its stamens have left a collar of pollen around the neck of the pistil. There is no danger of self-pollination though, because the stigma is not yet receptive. Soon the bees will come to this newly opened blossom to sip its nectar and carry the pollen away on their bodies. When the pollen is gone, the tip of the pistil splits into three curled parts, which are the mature stigma. Now the stigma will accept pollen, but it will have to be the pollen from another bellflower is accomplished without the danger of self-pollination. But wait, there is another mechanism at work here that is just as wonderful we see that the bellflower blooms from the bottom up, and it has a very good reason for doing this. The bees that pollinate the bellflowers can always be counted on to visit them, also from the bottom up, in the same order that they develop. So when a bee leaves a bellflower spike, she always has a fresh supply of pollen on her body. And when the bee goes to the next bellflower spike, she starts at the bottom, leaving her pollen load on the mature and receptive stigmas of the oldest blossoms on that stalk. The maturing of the stigmas and stamens at different times is a common device and is used by the dandy of flowers called the composites, which includes the daisies, the thistles, and the goldenrods, to name just a few. Each composite blossom is not just one flower, but it is a whole community of flowers, all working together to make themselves more obvious to bees and butterflies. If we look closely at a dandelion head, we see that each the stamens shed their pollen inside a tiny tube, and it is pushed out by the growing pistil. The little flower can't pollinate itself because the stigma is not receptive while it is pushing the pollen out. But once the pollen is taken away by the insects, the pistil splits in two and curls back, ready to receive pollen from another little dandelion flower. Or is take a more active part in getting their pollen onto their insect guests. While most flowers are content to collect, the mountain laurel has its own amusing device. Looking at one of the blossoms of the mountain laurel, we see that the pistil is sticking straight out, waiting to receive pollen from an incoming moth, while the ten stamens are held bent back around the sides. If we take a pin and pretend we are the moth, we will see that touching the stamens causes them to spring up and fling their pollen onto the insect. With this mechanism, the mountain laurel can let its stamens and pistil mature at the same time without the danger of self pollination Moth will have pollinated the stigma with the pollen of another laurel flower before it trips the stamens of this one. A similar but slightly different device is found in the flowers of the barberry, a thorny shrub also common as an ornamental. These flowers are much smaller than the mountain laurels. And here, our pin will act as the bee's tongue. See what happens when the tongue probes onto the bee's tongue. So the bee will go from barberry flower to barberry flower in search of nectar, cross-pollinating the blossoms by way of this clever device. The ingenious ways that flowers have of ensuring the continuation of their species. And we have seen the inseparable relationships between flowers and insects. But this is only a mere hint of the endless enjoyment that can be gotten from looking closely at flowers and their workings. 
Altenan in the many worlds of nature. <laughs>